Welcome to the fifth installment of the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast. Uh, this week, we're kind of piecing things together. Instead of doing a roundtable, uh, we're going to be doing some interview-style stuff in a couple locations. I'm coming to you live right now from my best friend's backyard. We're having a little barbecue. And my partner, Gordon Wood, and I, who you may remember from the uh, the last podcast, the roundtable, we got together. Uh, we both just bought into the uh, compact powered loudspeaker craze. Uh, I picked up a QSC K10, and Gordon has an Electro Voice ELX 115P. Uh, so we just dragged him out in the backyard. Real simple test, no measurement devices, no nothing. Uh, we just plugged him in, got out the iPod, fired up some Volbeat, uh, played a variety of stuff, some some different stuff. We heard acoustic guitars, we heard some rockabilly and some metal on them. Uh, we didn't get as far as plugging mics into him because I forgot to bring a mic that doesn't need phantom power. But anyway, a uh, little bit of a, an apples and oranges kind of test here. His His cabinet is uh what's the what's the body is it uh wood or mdf it's wood go figure gordon wood buys the wood cabinet mine's uh blow molded plastic his is based on a 15 and a horn mine's based on a, a 10 and a horn and what's the there was one difference we noted in the and we'll get to it in a bit but the uh the horn in yours is what's the setup uh i believe it's a 60 by 90 if i remember right and yours is a conical shape Right, so I've got a conical 90-degree horn in mind. So we're, as we were listening, we, we heard a few different things that, uh, that we'll get to. So anyway, let me hand the mic over to Gordon. Are you ready? Are you done checking your email? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me pass over to him. I'll, I'll let him talk about what he was thinking about for his when he bought them, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, well, basically, I was looking at the QSC stuff, knew it sounded great, but uh, it was a little bit pricier than I wanted to go, plus the plastic thing has me kind of scared. It's like I'm not rough on the gear, but at the same time, I do a fair amount of stuff in winter and plastic brittle, you know. But uh, anyway, so I got the EVs. Uh, they're actually a little bit cheaper, slightly more muddy down in the lower mid-range, but uh, other than that, clarity in the bass seemed to come through pretty good. Uh, 15, obviously, you know, drummer doesn't get scared when he sees a 10 on stage. Uh, higher than that, uh, it was basically just primarily going to be used as a monitor wedge, but uh, it might actually have some use on front of house for some intermediate sized stages. And I'll turn it back over to John to talk about the QSC. Well, I've been thinking about the QSCs, these little power deals for a while, and then uh, I blew my back out. It was actually moving to Soundcraft, although I'm not mad at consoles, but uh, I decided right then and there, laying in agony in a hospital bed, that I was going to sell off all my heavy stuff and buy a little self powered stuff. Um, I had known about these for a little while and had heard them before, and I decided to make the jump. It was actually pretty easy. Um, I actually cheated. I went out on eBay and bought them B-Stock, so uh, didn't do too bad on the price. And they're just tiny. Uh, you can juggle them. I'll post some links up uh, if you want to actually take a look at the products and the specs and stuff. Uh, both cabinets are rated at 1,000 watts. Uh, I'm not totally sure on the, the specs on the EV box, but the QSC is actually two 500-watt monoblocks internally. The one that's driving the horn is derated a little bit, so you don't have explosions. So it's actually good for, I think, 750 watts nominal. They sort of cheat there by saying, you know, it's 2,500, so they call it a 1,000-watt cabinet. Um, my plan was to use them as wedges uh, and as mains in smaller venues, uh, but all, probably always with subs. I mean, unless I'm doing really tiny stuff, little acoustic stuff, or uh, just slight vocal enhancements outside, um, they're always going to be sitting on top of a powered sub. I'm using some Yorkville powered subs right now. I'd actually like to get up to the... Uh, QSC has a K series and a KW series. The W series is is wood shells and different speaker configurations, but the the K sub is a little bandpass box that I think is based on tens, uh, good for a thousand watts. But the KW series is uh, an honest to goodness front firing eighteen inch cone, and those will knock your hat off. They're pretty nice. So what my goal is to eventually wind up with uh, you know four of the eighteen subs, uh, four uh, twelve two pull speaker tops. And six, roughly six of these little K10s to use as wedges on stage. And with a small digital mixer like the Prezonus uh, Studio 24, you got such an abundance of AUGS mixes that, uh, you know, instead of uh, the wedges really aren't, you know, like for a real rock act, big enough to do total monitor duty by themselves. But I'll pair them up and put instruments in one, vocals in the other, you know, in front of a front man or, you know, double up for a guitar player or a drummer what have you, and kind of make them do double duty. But they're so small. I mean, you could just you throw a million of them on stage, and they totally wouldn't be in the way. Um, listening to them, the QSCs have just a surprising amount of bass in them. Uh, the, the shop that I first found out about them at, uh, they had had a rep in. I think he threw some K-12s up on stands and had the little K-sub sitting under them. They're like, oh, yeah, that's, that's banging. That's a nice little sub. And he said, well, the sub's not on yet. Hang on. Um, so on, on the back of them, there's a... A setting for external sub, a normal setting, and a, a deep setting, which is just, you know, it's got a roll up at about 80. 
And uh, QSC did their homework. They figured it out. The box is nicely ported. It's not boomy, woofy. It's nice, solid bass. Um, although it flies, you know, outdoors, it, it floats away pretty quick. You'd want some subs. But um, here at this house, there's a couple of DJs hanging out who, you know, use seismic audio and Yamaha and, and those sorts of things. And their eyes all got big. <laughs> They're looking at these bitty, bitty speakers and no amp to drag around. Just plug it in and go. You, know, you, can, you can run out to a wedding with an iPod and a, a mic or a wireless mic. Set up next to the uh, the reverend for the ceremony, play a little music, say a few words, tuck the thing under your arm, and before the third or fourth picture's taken, you're set up inside, ready to DJ. And uh, not that I do that much stuff, but uh, I have a feeling mine are going to go out on loan here pretty soon and, and find out what life is like in the DJ realm. Uh, let me kick it over to Gordon here. I'll have him start out on uh, what things actually sounded like. We'll get his impressions on things, and then we'll uh, pass the mic around to anybody else that wants to chime in, and we'll wrap it up. Okay, during our little shootout between the QSC and the EV, found out uh, just a little bit of a slurring in like the low mid range on the EV. As monitor duty, QSCs you needed to be back about probably two three feet, whereas the EV had pretty well even coverage all the way up top, and could get right on top of them like a lot of people like to do. Sometimes stepping on them, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, Girl seems to hold up pretty good on that. Uh, I think it's like sixteen gauge powder coated steel. Uh, the EVs do have a little less uh, mixing functionality compared to the QSC, but like I said, I was looking basically just to hatch in a mix and be done with it there. But they do have inputs for your iPod, uh, two mics, and one other line source. Uh, no fan of power, as John mentioned. Originally, I was thinking the lighted logo on the front was actually a bad idea, but after using this on one show where somebody happened to trip over the power cord, kind of a nice little indication, you know, that it had gotten unplugged. You know, we could just look at it and go, oh, there you go. Problem solved. You know, anybody can look at that and quickly find out what the problem is. If it's on monitor duty, front of house, yeah, you may want to keep it off. But uh, I'll turn it back over to John here. All right. Uh, yeah, the only real difference, I mean, again, it's apples and oranges. He's got a, you know, a 15-2 uh, you know, his box is about probably more than twice the volume of mine. Um, so there's definitely some, probably a little more output coming out of his. We're uh, The markings are a little bit different. Uh, the QSC is actually marked for unity gain, you know, and nothing else. And his is marked all the way over at the maximum at plus six. So we were sort of guessing, like, well, okay, is the QSC at plus six? Is the EV at unity? Uh, but playing back and forth, uh, bottom line is uh, probably the EV is going to be able to drive a little harder. Um, but it also seemed to break up a little sooner. We went back and forth between the enhanced bass setting and, uh, actually on the, uh, on the EV, there's one switch, uh, which is either flat EQ or a scooped, you know, so boosted lows and highs, uh, on the QSC, you have the option to, uh, boost the bass. And then there's also like a vocal shape circuit in there, which if you're doing just vocals, like if it's a speech, you know, that you're amplifying works good for that. I wouldn't, wouldn't recommend it for anything else. Um, but yeah, little, my thoughts were yeah, a little bit of muddiness coming out of the, the EV. Um, the QSC has a, not necessarily muddiness, but there was a little bit of a hump. Um, the couple of times I've actually got to take them out with a band, I wound up doing some EQing front of house wise, uh, between like 250 and 350, just in that range. Uh, nothing drastic, just kind of evened it out just a little bit, um, to get things totally flat. Um, point blank, I feel like both of these would stack up really well. Like I, I got mine to fit into tiny spaces. I went in years ago and bought 15 inch wedges right when everybody else stopped buying 15 inch wedges. <laughs> and I, and then I also stopped working big stages, like larger, uh, like high school auditoriums, bigger outdoor stages where you had room for them. And suddenly I'm back in, in small rooms and you know, it, it was, they were just taking up way too much space. Um, so I went for something really compact. Gordon tends to work, uh, now that we're partnered up, he does the bigger stuff with his rig, so a little bit bigger box. He also has a lot more transport space. My my end goal is, well, I've already sold my, my big truck and my trailer, so I'm down to anything that needs to go needs to go in the minivan that I'm driving at this point. So um, size was was the name of the game. And the only other thing, uh, sound-wise, I realize we're kind of jumping around here, but uh, you can go to the product pages and, and read the propaganda and then compare it to what else is out there. Um... The horn in mine, we liked a little better, especially in the wedge configuration. Um, with them stood up vertically, uh, the coverage is really nice on both boxes, way out to the sides. Even behind them, they sounded good. Like, out to the mailbox, they sounded good. And these are pointed away from the road. Um, but uh, tipped back as wedges. Both units are back cut, so they can sit as a wedge. Um, 
the QSC, the transition between the cone and the horn was a little smoother. The crossover, I think, is maybe a little bit more sorted out. Um, but then again, you know, it's it's a matter of what you're going to be doing with it. I mean, I, really, in both cases, as as wedges, they're loud. Um, <laughs> you know, like I don't know. Depend you know, if, if you if your clientele is is that discerning, you should probably you know you're probably going to be looking at, at biamp wedges or something like that. But I mean, these things, uh, I have a feeling they 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 both stand up against smaller size boxes. Uh, Gordon's using some DB technologies. Uh, some little what are those twelve? Arena tens. Arena tens, which he uses uh, on poles, he doubles them up uh, with an adapter on a, a stand. Uses them for front, uh, which I've uh, we did that in about a four acre ballroom with a rock band and a DJ. That worked out great. It was louder than bombs in there. Um, I've used them on sticks for bands and bars and been told to turn down. And uh, I haven't had a chance to try them as wedges yet. That's one thing I'm still looking to do. But uh, all in all, like it's a it's a really exciting market. You know, people are looking at us like, why why are you buying these? Why didn't you do this ten years ago? Like, well, it, it really didn't exist ten years ago. Um, you know, Mackie had the SR four fifties and JBL had the Eons out, and they didn't sound good then. <laughs> you know, some people bought them, some people love them, but uh, yeah, we just weren't going there. Uh, Gordon's gonna chime in here. Yeah, just a quick thing about the uh, new JBL powered stuff. At least from every review that I've been able to come across online and the little bit of experience that I got to have with them, they're about ready to fry an egg by the time you've had them on for about an hour. So something tells me, you know, being an electrical, electrical engineer, extra heat in the product generally not a good thing. Tends to shorten the lifespan of components. So I'm gonna wager it's probably gonna blow up on you quicker than anything else. Right on. And, uh, yeah, everybody's getting into the game now. Um, I just saw some ads for PV's got a whole line of compact stuff out. Uh, I don't know who else is all all joining the group. But then, uh, you know, if you go up the line, uh, Rankis Hines, um, Mayer, they've all got some super compact, super powerful, really, really gorgeous sounding boxes. And they're money. But, uh, you know, if you do have that nicer clientele, and you're looking to be really small, portable, mobile. Um, there's some tiny, compact, powered stuff that's that's really kicking butt. One last thing I'll go into real quick here. Looking at the back of his, um, it looks like he can do two mics in or one of the inputs. Uh, first input is mic or uh, RCA in. Second input is mic or line in, uh, XLR or quarter inch. And then he's got a link output, uh, and he can have either just channel one go out or uh, one and two summed go out. On mine, uh, I've got a channel one, channel two. Channel one is micro line on a combination XLR quarter inch. Channel two is line only on XLR uh, combo XLR quarter inch connector. And then the RCA connections are also on channel two. Then on each channel, you've got an XLR out pre-fader and then a single uh, summed mono output post fader and uh, I, don't know, I have to get into the block diagram to figure out that I, i'm not sure if you can plug in your ipod and then daisy chain to another one and have it work out so that you still have a stereo mix but who cares really i mean if you're if you're setting up your ipod and a couple speakers for people to get drunk at a wedding party the stereo image probably isn't the highest thing on your your list um let's see here all right, I thought we were gonna get some other people to chime in they just uh, hollered that yeah they're loud sound good from across the yard so that's all we've got on our uh, our little powered stuff. As uh, both our rigs continue to develop, we'll probably do some more critical listening. I'm about to get smart on my laptop for work finally, uh, so we will actually sit down and, and do some quantifiable listening tests. Uh, so that's it for this segment of the show. Uh, next, I'm going to try and set up, and we're actually we're going to delve into the dark, dirty, depraved world of DJing, the DJ karaoke scene. Um, my best friend that I grew up with does it, uh, makes a good bit of money doing it, and we're going to talk to him about it, find out uh, what it's like, uh, if there's anybody out there listening that wants to get into it. Um, just know that you will be mocked by uh, by other pro audio people, but uh, by way of illustration, I used to haul 3,600 pounds of gear in and out of venues by myself and make the princely sum of $250 a night. He shows up with two speakers on a stick and a flat screen TV and never gets less than 800 so who's the fool? Uh, I'd be willing to deal with quite a bit of mockery if that was my station in life. So that's it for the Powered Speaker segment, and we will wrap or, uh, come back up here in a second and talk DJ stuff. All right, moving on. Now we're standing in front of the barbecue. I got my longtime, lifelong buddy, Brett, here, who is a reputable DJ in the area. Don't do that with the microphone, dude. There's kids. Sexy, yeah, I know it. <laughs> 
I wish you'd have said that on the mic. Anyway, that's why I'm why I'm interviewing him. There's a guy who I don't know how much he made DJing last year, but you heard me mention in the last segment uh, how much he made in a night compared to what I made in a night, and he's doing all right. So uh, I heard him recently, uh, not talking to, but talking about a young younger friend of ours who DJs and, and wishing that he'd be able to like loosen up a little bit and just kind of get into it. Because really, once you get some decent gear, and it doesn't sound like total butt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm adjusting it's, my pants. It's really all down to, you know, what can a DJ add to your experience? So, uh, anyway, I just wanted to get into it. What's, what's your philosophy like? What are, you, what are you doing when you walk into a room? Like, how are you sizing up the clients? What do you, what do you say? How do you act? What do you do? First thing I do, uh, I walk in and I look around at people's faces and see if they're D-bags or if they're happy people. I like the happy people way better. Um, yeah, that's, that's just the truth. You walk in a room, you can size them up, you know, the second you walk in the door. If they are they got that, you know, that look on their face that your mom told you if you keep making that face, it's going to stay that way. If they have that face, you're screwed no matter what you do. If they're happy-go-lucky, you know, happy-looking people, then we play happy-go-lucky music, and they have a happy-go-lucky time. I was thinking of the father from uh, wedding, uh, wedding Singer. The Wedding Singer. Yeah, you remember the father when he was... Uh the breakup <laughs> that's why i just pictured in my head yeah, yeah that, was, that guy <laughs> that was brandon chiming in about some, some scenes from the wedding singer that the dad and the wedding singer <laughs> i will strangle you with this microphone cord yeah, it's pretty much the truth dude brandon knows he dj's at the ghetto clubs <laughs> but what i'm getting at is is i've watched brett go into a room full of people and just murder them all night long like he, he's just got a way about him where you can like weapons, do do insult comedy all night long and get a huge tip for it. Listen, I don't know if it's just me or people in general, but for some reason, when you seem to have a microphone in your hand, you can say whatever you want, and they think it's funny, even if you're being a jerk. It's true. It's but not if you're being a plastic jerk. If you're not like, <laughs> hey, Mr. Personality, it's time for the Bucky Chicken Dance. Well, no, not everybody wants to sound like a DJ from a strip club, but <laughs> it's how you... I guess that's how you tell the joke, I guess. I don't know. It's easy to make fun of somebody. You just got to do it in the right way. And it tends to work out normally. But, yeah, as far as, as you know, when you're DJing, the personality is, is nine-tenths of it. I mean, anyone can push play on a CD player or, you know, an MP3 player, but it's, you know, it's how you interact with the crowd that you're working with. If you're boring and you're dry, then your event's going to be boring and it's going to be dry. If you're sarcastic and funny and you got witty things to say, then people react to it. Have you ever had it backfire on you? Not yet. Knock on wood. <laughs> Not Gordon. It, it, it doesn't doesn't hurt that he's a, he's a good sized fella, barrel chested, and covered in tattoos. Yeah, you know <laughs> that plays to my advantage. Like, ah, oh, we're gonna laugh because otherwise he might punch me in the face. But uh, <laughs> no, but you know what? Honestly, I've been doing it for so long. I know who to make fun of and who not to make fun of. You know, you don't pick the biker guy that just drank a quart of Jack and you don't start making fat jokes to him. You know, you you pick other people. <laughs> Now, um, technology-wise, like you're you're getting by pretty well. Like I've heard your stuff. Now, actually, it just came up, and it was funny because I I defended you royally, and I won. Uh, somebody was just getting into the game, wanted to put together a little pole speaker rig for their band. Said, "Hey, what about seismic audio?" I said, "Well, you know, my buddy's a DJ. He's been using the stuff forever. It sounds surprisingly good." And everybody's coming back, "Oh, that's DJ crap. You don't know what you're talking about." I'm like, yeah, you know. Well, with the ex- you know, besides being a DJ, because we're the you know toilet bowl of the music industry. I have also <laughs> been a drummer in live bands for over 20 years and the lead singer of bands for over 10 years and sound, you know, done sound and mixed for many other bands, including my own. And as far as seismic audio goes, not only does that guy spend an unbelievable amount of time custom making your stuff to your specs, I've owned my monitors that I own for over 10 years and they still thump the way they did the first day I bought them. And they do thump. You wouldn't they expect like a fifteen two wedge to have house shaking bass in it, but they do. They're actually really surprisingly good. For I've what actually is. done DJ gigs alone with those with those wedges in large, large hotel rooms with nothing but those and shook the floor. So I think it really goes to you know he stumbled onto something like he actually paid less money than he could have going out and buying you know Yamaha pole speakers or PV stuff or any of this other stuff that's out there the the really baby gigs like the customs and the Oh, I just made a lot of guys grimace with that. <laughs> there's a bunch of guys here. That, there's a bunch of guys here not on mic that are all like, oh, jeez. 
So I guess the point is, you know, not that we're here to plug Seismic Audio, although hey, maybe I'll link up to him on the site. We can get I'm plugging them. Buy them. <laughs> I don't care how hoity-toity you are, you D-bags. <laughs> Buy Seismic. They rock my ass off. <laughs> hey, it is a family show, oh, sort of. They rock my A double money sign there. <laughs> 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 and that's an example of how you keep it clean on the mic, kids. Uh, but really, what it is you don't have to spend a ton of money. You know, you know, there's there's all these sound snobs that'll go out there and, and say, well, you know, the, the crossover design and the frequency, you have know, like precious tone molecules and all this stuff. But really, think about what you, you know, your audience. I mean, are they they there to swell Budweiser and and listen to some party tunes, or are you going to be playing back like Mozart and and you know, truth be told, when when the extremists like yourselves jibber jabber that crap out of your mouths all you're really doing is telling everybody else you think they're smarter than they are than you really are <laughs> we're not make, those guys make, <laughs> make it sound good <laughs> that's what it comes down to i mean I, guys like gordon and myself go a little bit deeper into that but i mean brett found the same path to it like gordon and i did it because we're science geeks so we did research and testing and brett hunted around until he just found some boxes that sound really really good and then he kept buying them so once you get past the point where your gear doesn't suck and you can make good sound come out easily, uh, then it's a matter of, of knowing your client. I talk a lot about like meeting meeting the bands that I'm going to work for, getting to know them, getting them to trust me a little bit, finding out what it is that they want out of me. And what Brett's talking about is doing that same thing with you know the happy couple, the father of the bride, the proud parents of the graduate, the guy that's running the car show, your DJ, whatever it is. Um, it's it's really a people business. Even when you know, even when I'm on stage singing, I do the same stuff. You use the same personality. You know, I pick the people out of the crowd when I'm singing to them. You know, you pick out the ones that are got a good. You know, you can tell they got a good sense of humor. They're decent. You know, human beings. They're not going to go home and cry in and commit suicide later. Those are the ones you cater to. You leave the rest of them aside and don't say anything to them. <laughs> and they'll just, they'll just laugh at the show that you developed. <laughs> they'll, they'll laugh at the jokes you made on the other person as long as you're not making it at them. <laughs> but that's that's the thing about making it inclusive, getting people in on the game, uh, which you know, live sound guys aren't, you know, there's a pretty limited number of people that we get to play that because we're not playing to the crowd. We're working with the band, but we're trying to get, the good guys are trying to get on the same team as the performers, and the, and the good DJs are trying to figure out who the room is and then and then get in with them, make it, make it seem like a cool event. True story. You, look, you looked at me like you wanted me to add something. You looked like you were going to say something. So. No, no. I was trying not to burp in the microphone. All right. Uh, let's go back into technology a little bit. Were you still doing CDs when you got started on this? Or I you always... started with CDs. Uh, yeah, that sucked, man. No, it's up years, man. I'm not that old. Well, we both had back surgery, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I started with CDs, and I, would, uh, I used – back then, I, I used a – Audio Technia, uh, double-sided CD player with a mixer and some really junk speakers I bought. And after uh, that didn't sound very good, I took out a loan and bought some real gear. Actually, thinking back, Brett and I were together at the the Genesis like when we were. I think you were sixteen and I was seventeen. I bought my first speakers and amp. Built the very first mixer out of an old telephone. Yep, which I was just looking for that today. It's around somewhere. I just I still have my my original actual of my first Gemini mixer. I have in a rack in my garage, but uh, yeah, Brett and I were out trudging around with uh, we. I tried to be a DJ. We, had, Brett was, he was the hip hop guy. I was in charge of the microphone. He was the he was the one guy with soul in town. Like we were all whiter than white at my school. It was all Irish, German, Polish immigrant children, and but Brett had the most soul. So, like, See, he was, you guys make fun of me for thinking I was black for that eight months there it worked out well for all of us it did <laughs> me but, thinking i was black helped us all out but what that meant was between us like we maybe own 200 cds but with with two pole speakers a, and a bass amp you know a bass head and a five disc changer we were actually out at the tender age of 16 17 making money djing wow that was sometimes i still use cds Sometimes. I don't know why I brought that up. That just that went back, right? That was the very start. That was the year that I actually started getting paid to do audio. It was just to remember when, when people use CDs. That's all it was. <laughs> guy guy next to me started on cassettes. You know True story. I have used cassettes before. I have too. I've had to do it. Yep. I still got, I got a request this year, and this is in a facility where I don't really have a CD set up for for playing back CDs. Like I don't have a deck for it anymore because it died. So if I if somebody shows up, oh, I have a, I have tracks on a CD, those go in the Mac, and we play. But I actually had a guy show up who was going to play trumpet along with a backup track for a I don't know, graduation service or something. Had a cassette tape. 
I yeah. I find I, I dug around in the church and I found a deck that worked. I I almost had to mic up a boombox yeah, with right. a cassette playing in it. I, that was guaranteed to sound good. Yeah, that's what happens when you show up so late. You gotta uh, fill my beer. He, th- that guy was complaining. He's like, "Well, you know, over the years, I invested in thousands of dollars worth of these these backing track tapes. If I was going to do it on CD, it'd, it'd cost me thousands again." I was like, "Well, have your grandson look into MP3 for you because you could probably have you all set up on an iPod in about twenty minutes one afternoon. You could put it on your credit card and be done with it." But anyway, you, so you made the jump to MP3 a little bit ago. Sure did. And you're using cellular technology while you're out on the go to get those sure requested am. tracks. You ever uh, had to resort to YouTube? Yes, I have. <laughs> um, the good thing is, as far as that goes, is Spotify exists now. And uh, what a savior that's become. But yeah. Uh, is that legal? Yeah. yeah nice. It's through Facebook. Yeah, but but is it, it? No, it's well. I know it's legal, to, like to listen to. It's not illegal, like for you to, to listen to the tracks, but like for you to use them as a DJ. Is that cool? Well, or do you have to go for an extra license? All right. So here's the thing, as far as licensing goes, I have to pay a company called BMI um, a nice chunk of change every single year for licensing. Um, I'll be attacked by the rest of them eventually. They cover about sixty to sixty-five percent of all the artists, and you know the other companies will be up my butt soon enough. I'm sure. But as far as spot it, or the, the actual like legal way to do it is you're not supposed to play anything commercially with five or more speakers. So I keep my system down to five or less speakers, and then you're not in front. You know you don't get busted for that. Um, Spotify, you know what? They play the songs I need immediately, and if I get caught, you know I don't think the Men in Black are standing behind me watching, but. Well, but if you're if you're paying ASCAP and BMI, that's really the right way to do it. Because then it doesn't matter what medium you're using. You could you could play CD. You could play Edison right. wax cylinders if you want. Right. The, the, only, the artist is going to get their their cut then theoretically. Yeah, the only thing you ever have to worry about as far as that goes is is the people that aren't covered by BMI. You know, eventually they all come after you. I'm sure they do. You know, I've heard stories of it. It hasn't happened to me yet, but. I'm sure they're coming. Well, but thank you for doing it right, because <laughs> I've watched a number of my friends get signed to real live recording contracts, some of them national, and have to stop doing it because they couldn't make any money at it because of piracy. There was pretty much no way to get paid for their art, and so they all went back to day jobs. Yeah, that's kind of how the world works these days. In fact, you know, half of our friends that got signed on Vagrant Records and all that stuff got boned in the end. Yep. So, uh, all right, any other any other wisdom to impart on anybody wanting to get into the business or grow their business, or uh, what do you got? You know, be charismatic. Don't be a lamo. You know, have some personality. If you don't have any personality, then you're not gonna be you're not gonna be any good. You're not getting any gigs. Um, it only takes, you know, one bad gig to ruin you for good. So if you have one bad gig, that's the word that spreads. No one says, you know, no one runs around talking about how amazing their DJ was. Everyone talks about how horrible their DJ was. Oh, and also bring around a guy with you twenty four seven that can lift heavy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's our boy They'll, Rob. They will do it for almost nothing, and they lift all your crap. I pick Find one of those. I put them down. <laughs> <laughs> and if yeah, if you know yeah, your personality, that's the thing. if you want to become a DJ and you know you're going to suck at it because you're not funny and you have no personality, um, ask John for my number and I will go do the gig you got offered. Those guys entertainment. <laughs> <John. laughs> As long as it's not too far away, because I hate driving, and I stay busy enough to where I don't have to go very far. Well, there I'll you have it. it. That's uh, that's what we got for DJing. Love it, hate it, that's what it is. It's out there. There's a ton of work to be had, and honestly, if you're sitting there, if the band scene uh, isn't working out for you, and you can stomach it, might be worth getting into, diversifying a little bit. One other thing I wanted to ask you real quick before we finish up is, you know, we talked about you, like, meeting your crowd and sizing them up. Um, what do you do, uh, like, weddings in particular, I'm thinking of? Like, how much work do you do with, say, the happy couple before you go in? A ton. Actually, I meet them all for a, a meeting beforehand where I sit down and have either lunch or dinner with them. And I get to know them. I ask them to bring their families with them so I can meet them as well. Uh, we usually sit down, and I learn all, as much as I possibly can about all of them. What kind of music they're into, where they came from, you know, the kind of people they hang out with, because that way I know what to have ready on hand. Um, you know, if if they seem like they got you know a little country vibe to them, I'll make sure I have new country in my in my list on the way up. But then I have another meeting with them afterwards, when they have their um, when they know what their guest list is going to be, and then they go through the guest list with me, and they say, well, you know, this group of people is, you know, they're very 
quiet or very Christian or very, you know, they won't be into it. And then I know what I'm getting into. You know, so I show up and I'm like, okay, so I'm going to have a huge crowd of people that aren't going to get up on the dance floor at all. So I have to keep them entertained at some point in the evening so they don't get all sad and go home. And but then yeah, you got your I set for when, three times before. when Grandma and Aunt Edna get up and leave, then you can cut loose, get the yeah. teenagers on the dance floor. Now yeah, that's, that's... I meet up. I, I meet with them, and I try to plan out their entire evening. Every every DJ, especially when it comes to weddings, you are going to become their coordinator no matter what. Um, if you if you book a gig with somebody and they even have a wedding coordinator, that person just became non-existent because you just became in charge. <laughs> One, you have the microphone. <laughs> Two, you have all the electronics, and you have the personality, and you're the one in charge of time. So when they, from them getting introduced, you are now in control of how the rest of their night goes. Right on. So that's pretty much, you know, it's you're in charge from that point on. So I, I do, I meet with them as much as I possibly can to get everything ironed out as much so I don't have to talk to them at all, all night long. And that's the kind of work ethic that I'm talking about. The guys that are going to get ahead aren't necessarily the guys with the super expensive gear. Uh, it's the guys who are going to make that extra effort like i don't know another dj anywhere that's having multiple meetings with clients beforehand i mean if anything they show up all right here's my book of songs pick out what you want or pick out the ones you don't want and off we go so here you have a guy who's meeting with family looking at the guest list really trying to get inside his clients heads and that's why he's making what do you make a night six eight thousand well it really depends on the night i guess i'm way nicer to family members and friends i guess on a good night i usually pull between 12 and 17 Dang, I am in the wrong <laughs> business. <laughs> but I, mean, I don't have that's the a good night. I mean that you know. But right. when it comes down to it, I mean I charge for my fuel. I charge, right. you know, if I like, I have a. Well, does wedding. that do in karaoke too? Because I know that's a pain. I do one set price. Um, my base price. I will always start my base price or my base price out the same, which is five hundred bucks for four hours, oh. and then every hour after that, you know, is different. But they get everything I have. If they want it, karaoke, the video screens, all that stuff, they get everything for one base price. And then for, you know, the more, the usually the four hours covers dinner and a couple hours of dancing. And then afterwards where you start right. making the money. Yeah. Because when everybody's good and lubed. And- yeah. You know, especially depending on where the place is. If you have it in a, in a hotel room, you're out by 11, but some people have it in, you know, their backyards or they have it, in a, you know, park or whatever without you know, any time restraints and they just want to keep going. You know, I've had a couple of weddings where I've gone till two, three in the morning and I've brought home 3000 bucks. So I, uh, <laughs> I'm in the wrong business, <laughs> but gigs don't come nearly as steadily as when you guys, you know, there's always bands that need sound. So it's yeah, not lately. Things are, things are shifting. <laughs> I, I mean, there are, can be there can be entire winters where I don't have a single gig. Yeah, well, there's there's seasons. I mean, there's you know my my Julys and my Novembers are great. I haven't made a dime in the month of January in ten years. So um, it's worked out pretty nice as far as you know that goes. Because when I'm in the band, busy season seems to be more in the winter area, and DJ takes off in the fall. So I'm steadily doing something all the time. That's the key. So to sum it all up, get decent sounding stuff. Be good to your clients, figure out what they want, and give it to them in spades. Be willing to go the extra mile. I know as sound guys, you know, we get hired, people think we're just, we're just the microphone guys, but quite often when you hire us, you're also getting a stage manager, a technical director, an electrician, mechanic, guy to break into the bass player's car when he locks his keys in there. We just, we'll do anything and everything that needs to be done. I've wound up doing makeup and sewing costumes on theater gigs so that the oh, curtain could go up on time, painted sets. Yeah, Rupert, I actually read, I got Billy standing here. He's a, a young friend of ours that recently got into uh, DJing by working with Brett. But he started out with me. I was mixing a theater production. He was playing bass in the pit, and his bass dropped out during the overture. So I run down there, what's going on? Well, my bass could work. All right, come in the back. So we get two scenes into it to a scene where there's only two actors on stage. I'm like, all right, sit at the mix. It's two guys. Watch these two faders. I'm going to fix your bass. So I already had the soldering iron hot. I turn around. Pop the screws out, solder up the jack, throw it back together, hand him his bass. He stands up and says, cool, what are faders? <laughs> so I, wish, I don't know if the mic picked up everybody laughing, but that's, that's one of my favorite stories. But anyway, Bill's, Bill's getting into it. He slowly bought some gear, and he's, he's learning it and learning how to do it. He's done some sound for bands, too. So. You know, when you were talking about the dedication thing, that reminded me of a wedding we did not too long ago is... You know, you really get to know these people and you really start to like them or whatever. And we did a wedding not too long ago where Rob, my assistant here, went and fixed the bride's shoe before the reception. 
You know, it's <laughs> you know, not only are you are you playing their music and you're keeping their you know you're keeping their party going. He's out fixing their wardrobe so they don't look stupid when they come out. Right. You know, I've washed grooms ties with club soda before they make their entrance. You know. It's, that's so true. Like I think of, I, I get asked to be in a lot of weddings, fortunately. So I, I wind up, you know, they're in my rented tux, and I'm always trying to figure out somewhere to jam my Leatherman. And my wife's like, "Will you leave that stupid thing?" Alone? I'm like, "Nope, honey. I'm, I'm like a cop or a military. I'm, I am always on duty." <laughs> and sure enough, I mean, I've had to pull that thing out. The cake table's about to collapse. It's got two thousand dollars worth of towering cake on it, and the legs loose. So Johnny's under there whipping out the Leatherman, tightening it back up. I think it, there's a lot to be said about it. You know, the dedication aspect of it too. I mean, it, I think I. See stay as busy as i stay because of the things that we do when we're out there you know even you know like fixing the bride shoes and, and all the crazy things we do i mean we do some really off the wall stuff for wedding couples you know even like karaoke nights and stuff like that you know we do things that no other dj does and when you go to a wedding it, like if you're going to become a dj if you're interested in becoming a dj you've all been to weddings <laughs> I don't know what that's all about. But anyway, so you've all been to weddings and you've either said, man, this is boring, this DJ is boring, or you've been to weddings where you're like, holy cow, this is awesome, we had such a great time. Pay attention to that guy. You know, learn from the people that you've seen already do it. That's happened too. Yeah, we've had a lot. This man wants a fight. Luckily, because we're very large, we've avoided some catastrophes because there's always that guy. Always. Always. There's always that guy. Angry drunk. Someone at a, a wedding did not like my tie and called me an 80s faggot and wanted to fight me. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a white tie. It was all it was. That was actually the story I was getting after one. I, I guess that, that wasn't something you said that backfired. That was just bad at <laughs> yeah, wardrobe choice. Yeah, I guess. I, guess. I, wear, you know, I wear 40s clothes to my weddings. That's my gimmick. You know, and A white tie was part of that, and apparently this guy didn't, get, he didn't like it. He confused 40s with 80s, but we'll let it go. He ended up bad in jail enough. that night anyway, so it doesn't matter. Right on, right on. Uh, so actually, uh, another thing I want to ask: uh, Do you do any advertising, or are you working solely on word of mouth at this point? I do advertising. I mean, I do the you know the good old Facebook and and uh, you know a couple articles here and there throughout. In print media. Yeah, you know, throughout the years, uh, Howard Owens did a little little get up on me a couple of years ago when he started the Batavian. That's an online uh, news blog in the neighborhood. Just covers um, our county. Yeah, I mean, uh, our Daily News did a story on me a while ago that helped, but most. You know, for the most part, it's word of mouth. You know, people asking for business cards at the event. That's how I got all. I've never done a print ad in my life. I've only ever handed out yeah, business cards I, at gigs. I, That's never, people find you when you're working. I and, have never once paid for advertising, yep, ever. Yep. And it, it, it sucks when you're not working because that's where you do get most of the stuff. I mean, fortunately, after a while, you, you build up sort of a rep, and, and then you people will cold call you like, hey, you know, you did sound for my buddy's band, and, you know, we're getting a band together. We really want, you know, we heard you were good, and we always like the shows and stuff. So, like, I, I do get the word of mouth like that, but that's a little bit fewer and farther between. Like, mo more often than not, people will walk right up to me while the gig's going and, and hit me up for my number. Yeah, that's pretty much how I get. I'd say probably ninety percent of my gigs is while we're at a gig, somebody will come up and say, "Can I have your business card?" Or someone will say, "Who the hell was that DJ that you had? We want him." That's yep. pretty much every some every gig I have this summer is someone that was at a wedding I did last summer. Yep. And this guy's, you know, he's really recognizable. Like the when he's all duded up in his zoot suit <laughs> with the hat. And he's he's pretty much famous around here. Like he walks into places, people know him, and uh, we kind of went the same way. You know, like we got shirts made up. We also wear kilts, which we can get into at another time. But uh, somebody we don't even know like recognized us to you know was talking to another guy. You're like, oh hey, what well, you know you mix here? Where else do you mix? Oh yeah, I kind of mix with the GPG. Like, oh, hey, those those guys with the kilts. So weird Man, stuff it's, pays it's off. Saddle shoes. It really was. It was like I want the DJ with the saddle shoes. Right. And that's. <laughs> It, that's all it takes is you got to get them a hook. So, you know, when you're thinking about that stuff, do something that's going to be instantly recognizable. You know, if you're going to put a logo on your shirt, don't put a million words of text down there. Get a super logo that you can see from three football fields away, and somebody will remember that and look you up. As far as, oh, that's another thing. As far as, as DJing goes, I don't know about live sound, but when it comes to DJing, my advice to everybody is don't promote yourself at all on your stuff. Don't have your logo, your name on anything. Because it's offensive, people are taking pictures, you know, in a in a wedding setting. It's supposed oh, to be definitely. it's supposed to be fantasy and it's supposed to be dreamy and gorgeous and beautiful. And the last thing they want to see is some piece of crap banner hanging across your table. You know, if somebody really wants your information, they're going to come ask for it anyway. Right. So you don't need to promote yourself. Yep. Yeah, I always tried to make my stuff as nondescript as possible because I was doing a lot of theater gigs. You know, I've got my my business name stencil on the back of all my boxes or whatever, just to 
prevent theft or keep my stuff straight from other guys' stuff when we're collaborating on gigs. But yeah, I, I never emblazoned my stuff around. And we work a lot of rock gigs, so it's it's cool to walk around with a shirt like that. But you know, we're doing the theater. We put on a shirt and a tie, not a tie necessarily, but you know, button down shirt or at least a plain black shirt. And, and we're very nondescript because it's not about us at that point. You know, we're trying to be invisible and just let the event be what it is and be out of the way. And it doesn't it doesn't hurt being unbelievably handsome. Painfully, yeah, shockingly handsome. That's why I bring Rob. Being this cute, I pick things up and put them down. It helps. It really does. <laughs> and the job stopper tattoos down to the knuckles. <laughs> <laughs> they stop at my wrists. Yeah. All right, cool. So that uh, we want to talk a whole lot about DJing. I don't know how much time we got. Wow, there's actually not much. There's of the show lots left. to talk about. It's DJing. It's awesome sauce. <laughs> Well, it's paying the mortgage at one house that I know of. So. Yeah, see, bought this pretty house. If you're sitting on a stack of speakers and they're not doing much, maybe it's time to uh, get a music library and get out there and see what you can do. Just don't take my business, because then I get mad. Right on. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna try and uh, we're gonna close up this segment, and I think with the time that's left on this show, we're gonna get with uh, a couple of guys who just mixed some theater. My partner and I were both deployed to two different high school auditoriums this week to take care of a couple different theater productions. And uh, we weren't free to be there. We went to the load-ins, and uh, I actually didn't go to my load-in. But uh, you know, we, we went and got them set up for success, and uh, they've done a bunch of stuff with us, and then we turned them loose. So uh, I'm going to try and get one or both of those guys uh, on the mic here, and we'll talk about the experiences of a couple young up-and-coming local engineers and uh, what they did last week. Or maybe I can just get them to write an essay. Eh, that would be boring. All right, back to the barbecue. We're going to sign off here for now. All right, changing subject now and venue. Uh, it's a couple days later. Uh, we're trying something different for the podcast this week. It's sort of my version of a clip show. Um, started out at a backyard barbecue. Now we're at BNB Sound, North American headquarters, a.k.a. my kitchen. Uh, my man, John Bioko, my right hand at the moment in the theater mixing realm, also known as Chachi to the masses, has joined me. Uh, we just finished up a production last week. Uh, Gordon and I were actually both out on theater productions Neither of us were free to mix them, so uh, we got a couple other cats to sit in for us. We went to the load-ins and helped them get tweaked out. Uh, this was Chachi's first show out in the world. He had done a bunch of high school shows on his own, but with a rig that was already set up, and he had done a bunch of shows with me where we would load in together and tech the whole week, and by the time we got down to the mixing, uh, the last couple of shows we did, he would mix one act and I would mix the other, and we'd, we'd take turns feeding each other the notes and tweaking stuff. Um so this is the first one where I came to load in, and I made a couple other quick facial appearances, and that was about it. He was really on his own. So he found out just how much I was contributing. <laughs> He's chuckling because we would talk about shows like, yeah, we mixed that together. When you know he, he was definitely capable of pushing faders for a whole act and doing a good job on it, but maybe didn't realize just how much tweaking uh, his counterpart did. So anyway... Uh, the show was footloose. It was in a tiny little middle school auditorium with terrible acoustics, um, but he got it sounding pretty good. Went through the whole process, uh, more or less the way I taught him. Uh, some of the stuff he had to kind of figure out on his own. So I'm going to turn the mic over to him, and let's see, where to start? Where to start? Why don't, why don't you just talk about like how it was like hopping into the captain's chair there with, with no co-pilot at first? Well, it was a little nerve-wracking. But I, I had a good, I had a good head with it, and uh, started the show, and the first two scenes were going too good, and that's when I kind of knew I was in trouble, and then I started having all sorts of dropping out issues and such, you know, just the normal things. So you know, I troubleshooted it the way you told me to, and then realized that it wasn't going to work. <laughs> So uh, I did wind up coming back into the show a couple of times, uh, answered a few panicked text messages. We eventually, uh, we'd really sort of just done all we could do. I mean, it was down to there were some RF issues in the building, and some of the equipment was kind of aging. It actually wasn't RF issues, but just a lot of the microphone, the lavalier mics that they were using, the mic elements were starting to age out. They were getting a lot of crackling in them. Um, well, at any rate, uh, the the philosophy that we go on is, you know, you start out, we're only on a show, a given show. We do a lot of community theater, a lot of high school theater. You're on a show for a week as a sound tech. Uh, we had a little bit of a jump on the gun here this time because we loaded in on a Friday and had a little more leisurely pace for teching the show. Uh, it also wasn't a huge show. It was at, uh, just 14, 14 mics, but didn't use all of them, I think. 
It was uh, 14 microphones, supposed to be 16 um, with some switches, and then they made it so there was no switching. So it was only 14, but it was a lot harder than the Summer Youth that we just worked. Summer Youth is the uh, the big theater extravaganza uh, in August every year. The the local one of the local community theaters does an all youth production, and casts have run into the 90s. I mean, there are just so many kids in these shows. We're talking about community youth theater where, I mean, we've brought a 40 channel analog desk in and filled it. You know, 26 channels of wireless, six mics, stationary mics on the stage, inputs coming out of the pit, inputs, uh, you know, samplers, CD players, computers video feeds, uh, just all manner of nonsense. But anyway, back to this this little show in this little room. Uh, we actually did the whole thing. The The rig was really tiny. We had a, a pair of QSC K10s for front of house. Uh, at the mix was my partner Gordon's Prezonus 24-channel digital desk. No outboard gear other than um, I brought a standalone uh, Behringer digital EQ that had an RTA in it so he could kind of keep an eye on things, help uh, catch those surprise bits of feedback there, uh, went under the gun. But um, what it comes down to when you mix a gig like this is, you know, you've only got a week on it, and dress rehearsal is Wednesday or maybe Thursday at the latest. And so you've got to, like, get through all the technical stuff and get down to making art really pretty quick. And uh, unfortunately, due to just some time constraints and some technical difficulties, Chachi didn't really get there until uh, about the Thursday halfway through, he says. Uh, well, yeah, and there he did – there were some other – there were some other elements. There were some some issues going on with the pit band that were rhythmically throwing off the cast, and so they were being very cautious while they were fishing around for the beat. And then, you know, a lot of these kids were real powerhouse singers, so they would hold back, and then they would come in, and so dynamically things were kind of nuts. But um, yeah, I was really proud to see him. He was uh, he didn't bug me as much as I thought he was going to. He got got in there, and uh, Chachi's a young guy too. He's only eight, eighteen years old, eighteen years of age, but. Been working in theater since he was 13. You got, what, a couple dozen shows under your belt? Just not. I'm here to make you look good, babe. All right. And uh, so what? when he was done wrestling with the tech, then he was starting to go back in Thursday and Friday, you know, even during the first performance, uh, starting to sneak, uh, work on the compression, get that just a little bit smoother. Not so much utilitarian, but smoothing settings out, making things as transparent as possible, starting to engage uh, some expanders uh, to raise or lower the noise floor, rather, uh, get some of the, the rustle and the bustle out of there. Um, and But yet he also had to keep the mix agile enough because uh, there were a few bit players that didn't have mics on. They were near players that did have mics on, and so he had to, to piggyback and not have the mic actor be too loud in relationship to the other actor who would be a few feet of the way, few feet away, and uh, you know, and have to sort of shout his line into the side of somebody else's face and have it all work out. So, you know, dynamically it was pretty challenging. But by the end of it, he was able to really get in there and start making art, like tweaking EQs to to get people who had gotten sounding sort of maybe a little tinny, maybe a little screechy, a little unnatural because he was fighting feedback, going back in easing back up on the EQs, you should, there was no feedback. Here. There, there actually wasn't as much feedback as I thought. It was more popping, dropping out than anything else. Feedback maybe one night, I think it was dress rehearsal, and that was it. It was like maybe two frequencies that I had notched out and problem solved. So the, the feedback wasn't my issue. It was the dropping out, people sweating in microphones to the point where they just stopped working, stuff like that. Well, that's where my years of experience come in. I had come in. One of the things I did for Chach before I left was kind of bulletproof the graphs, um, just really tweaked them out hard. Um, and then he wound up tweaking them some more when he thought that was the issue, uh, but I was proud to say that uh, once things got sort of situated, he went back in, started touching the graphs again. Uh, he showed me the curve one night, and I was like, you know, they say after you've touched more than half of the faders, you should probably just wipe it and start over again. So Fortunately, uh, that's easily enough done on a digital desk, and he went and did it. Um, I didn't sit there and tell him to do it. He just kind of jumped in there and figured it out. Uh, he did it more by just sort of relaxing some of the stuff that he had pushed in, got things sounding a little more natural. Um, really, once he got into it, all I had to go back in there and do was uh, – it was kind of nice. The actors would come out for sound check every night, and they'd say a few words, and then they had each picked out a pop tune from the era – to sing. So that was cool. You got, you know, at most maybe a verse and a chorus, but it was a nice little bit of singing. And so we got to hear, because actors will sandbag you a little bit. They'll come out and they'll just go, you know, check one, two, one, two, uh -huh, check one, two. Oh, is that my hand? You know, my food's here. Hang on. 
uh, and not really give you the performance that they're going to give you once. The curtain goes up and the audience is there. So um, having them sing got them to push out a little, get a little more natural performance going. And so we were able to, you know, right there, just spend a minute with each one. Like, all right, he's a little thin, so we'll take this down. Fat no up with a little bottom EQ. This girl sounds a little screechy, a little whiny, so we'll take this out, boost this a little bit. And, uh, you know, for tiny little condenser mics that are smaller than a pencil eraser, perched on, you know, actors' ears and in their hair and on their costumes and taped to their faces, um, you wouldn't think you could get really good natural sound out of it. But uh, despite that fact, you know, that Chachi was able to mix a few scenes where, um, you know, you'd really get the chills. Like, some really talented young kids doing a good job singing and putting the emotion out there and... Despite being in a lousy room on a tiny sound system, uh, he was able to really make the performance shine. So uh, I realize I'm kind of hogging the mic on this one. <laughs> he's, he's he's used to me running my mouth. Um, any other thoughts you got on the show? Like any? What? Tell me what? What? Coming into this and going out, like what was the one big lesson that you're gonna take away and head into the next show with? Uh, there's so many. I had to teach myself things. I had to be my own John Dayton, which was very difficult. Big shoes to fill. Um, no, beard. no beard. No. Clean shaven, a lot younger John Dayton. Um, I don't know. I, I honestly learned so much about, oh, my my style of mixing and what what I should be doing that's different. And I, I couldn't even tell you. I, the whole show was a learning experience. Um that's really all I could say about it. I mean, I have really nothing else to say other than I learned everything. It was like I learned everything over because I did it myself. And I had to actually do it myself and figure it out. And there you have it. There's only so much that you can learn. Um, I've actually written a bunch of articles for Chachi and some of the other guys that work for us, one of which uh, was just posted as the first part of our, our theater post on the blog, which you should look up if you mix in the theater at all. Uh, another good article, uh, Carl just posted uh, part two on that. Mine was sort of more technical. His was sort of more uh, person-related, like the prep work that you do script-wise and, and assistant-wise. But um, – so yeah, like the Chachi was really under the gun here and didn't have me for backup. So it's you know it's one thing to have your mentor there and saying, you know, oh you know it's really shrill. You need to you know touch one one point five k on that actor's mic or gosh they're all really shrill. So you need to go do it on the need to go do it on the graphs. Um, in a learning experience, you know if you're if you're being taught by someone, you know there's always that safety net. There's always somebody sitting over your shoulder sort of reminding you about stuff that you know, and it kind of takes the pressure off a little bit, which is cool when you're when you're finding your style. Um, I used to really put the pressure on Chachi to work on his balance, to, to you know, not turn aside as much and, and make commentary on the show, but to really keep his head on stage with the actors, not look at the gear, um, which is actually something else we need to talk about in a minute, um, but to really work on consistency, getting your head in the space of the show without letting yourself get carried away by it. Um, one thing we always find is there's always one scene in every show that just you forget you're in an auditorium. Hopefully this is happening the whole show for the audience that, you know, the the seats and the lights and the speakers and everything else kind of go away and they get drawn into the story. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be very transparent and just let the actors do their thing. Um, we've been fortunate enough to work on a lot of shows where they even get us at some point where we totally believe that, you know, these actors on stage are a family or our enemies or, you know, whatever heart heart wrenching song they're singing is is for real. Um, but, uh, what Chachi said, he, uh, <laughs> he really had to, you know, find where the rubber met the road on a lot of different fronts and had to sort of remember all the things he'd been taught. And like he said, relearn some of them again. Uh, but now those things are really cemented. Like I've always felt pretty confident in Chachi as a mixer. And now I would actually feel confident to send him out and, you know, let him be the lead guy totally on a show and start to teach somebody else, which is, a pretty good accomplishment, considering that he's only just out of high school. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is um, getting your head into the stage. One of the things we've developed, I developed actually, and I, I pass this on to all the people that I mix with, is um, it's real common practice on a theater production to just have a script and write all your notes in the script. Well, if you do that, every 30 seconds you have to turn the page or you have to not watch what's going on stage and read along with the page or at least scan it periodically for your notes. Um, fairly early on, I started doing just a few pages of notes for a show and eventually I developed a little, um, I'll try and get a, a, a sample page up on the blog. Um, 
I just have a bunch of hieroglyphics and and styles of writing, like uh, you know all the all the mics are numbered, so that shortens things up. I've got a few little arrow symbols that mean this and that. Uh, if there actually is a cue line, I'll do that. But really, all it is is just you know if I know okay a scene is going to open, do I really need all this information? You know, like okay, lights up, song does this, then you know just at this point you bring up these three mics. Not really. I've I've already seen this show three, four, five times. It's starting to be committed to memory. So I can say for Act 1, Scene 3, just write down the three mic numbers. As the lights come up for that scene, I'm putting my fingers on those three mic numbers. And then I'll have to look at my notes again. Like, those three actors hit the stage. I glance down real quick. I see that, okay, you know, there's two more mics that are going to come on in a minute. I know who those people are. Um, if it's something where they I need to catch a line where they're coming off stage, I'll actually write a line of dialogue in there. But, and then there's different hieroglyphics for... Uh, solos, people that come on in groups, people that are on again, off again real quick. Uh, sound effects have their own little notation, but I can fit all the notes for a two-and-a-half-hour theater run on one sheet of wide-ruled notebook paper, and that's killer because that I've spent all week, and I have to kind of remind my directors about this. I, uh, Chachi's got a post coming up on the blog that he wrote about his experience on this show, and you know he had that classic thing where we, you know, we load it in, and then the next day, uh, you know, 15 minutes into the first rehearsal with actors wearing microphones, the director's turning around and squawking about how things aren't perfect yet. Um, and that's pretty common. Like, you have to sort of remind them. It's good if you can do it in advance. Be like, hey, listen, you know, first day, it's going to be a train wreck. We're going to be sorting stuff out. Uh, we're going to be taking notes. And I have to keep telling directors, like, you know, you missed this entrance. You missed that entrance. I'm like, well, yeah, I missed that entrance. And then I missed some other stuff because I was not mixing. I was writing notes down so that the next time through, I'll be ready in advance. And it just... You know, working on the time scale that we do, where we're not with the actors for the whole six or eight or twelve weeks that they're prepping a show, we're just coming in at the last minute. Um, having a really efficient notation style lets you get over that hump real quick. But then, when it really comes down to it, when there's a house full of people and uh, you know if something goes wrong, you can't stop. You have to keep mixing the show, so you you know you can't afford to lose your place on a page in a script. Um, you know, you need to be able to shout to a stage manager or a stage hand over a, a Clearcom headset and get them to check somebody's batteries or mic pack or whatever. Uh, you need to keep an eye on the scene that you're in and and keep doing the job. Um, so all of those things lead to, you know, by the time we actually sit down to mix, what I like to do is have an assistant, even if they don't know anything. Like, you just, you just teach them how to take notes for you, and that can speed things up. You just say, all right, you know, all right, this is scene three, market church, so we have a reference point. Okay, scene opens. You got one, three, seven, nine, and 11 through 15 are, are all on stage. Write that first. You know, so it's one, comma, three, comma, seven, comma, nine, comma, dash, 11, 13, dash, whatever. Whatever our little notation is, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting kind of long-winded about this, but once you get down to the end, when you're, when you're mixing in the theater – quick glance at the page or even better have your assistant read it off to you or you know do something like punch the solo button on every channel that's coming next just reach over and do that to market for you so next time you get a chance to look down but what i said all that to say this it's really important to keep your eyes by the time you're actually sitting down to mix the show you're not looking at the compressors you're not looking at the channels you're not messing with eqs unless something goes horribly wrong you're just keeping your eyes on the stage because you know even professional actors like the show you know they'll say it's frozen but stuff changes. People come in with different energy levels. Um, you know, something might happen with a pit orchestra and timing lines be going off. So you've, you know, somebody might jump a line, lose their place, whatever. Uh, so you have to, if you're focused on your notes or your script or looking at the the racks, you're not totally in tune with that. So that was kind of a long way around the block to say that. Well, uh, got anything else to contribute, Chachi? Before we sign us up? Yeah, I got a couple comments about the notes. Yeah, I I started taking notes maybe Wednesday, the day before dress rehearsal, and miraculously by Friday I uh, had the whole show memorized, uh, which is kind of a thing that I do. I just start memorizing, you know, scenes, you know, where faders are, so I don't even have to look, um, which is kind of like my style of mixing. I like to memorize it because the more I watch the show, the better it's going to be. Yes, the director was yelling at me Sunday, Monday wasn't perfect. But, you know, it's it's theater. It, it can never be perfect on day one, even though they want it to be. Other than that, I mean, I, I thought the... It, I thought it was together. And I thought that, um, minus a couple things in the pit orchestra, that everything was sounding good. Um, you had some really strong actors. 
yeah, a lot of the actors we had were were pretty strong, and that's why I came into the show thinking, oh, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to have to do no work, and I actually ended up doing more work than I've ever done in my whole life on a theater show. Um, have it be the room, the gear, or whatever. I don't know. In the end, though, I think I got it sounding pretty, pretty good. Where I was actually happy with it. I'm never happy with the mix ever. So. Unless you're mixing, then I'm pretty happy with it. But <laughs> yeah, that's that's true though. Like, uh, I, you know, I hear guys talk about movies and record projects. That's, they're sort of not ever finished. They're sort of abandoned. Uh, you get them to a point where either you just don't have time, or it's good enough for the client, or it's over, <laughs> or whatever. But I'm the same way. I'm uh, I get so that I'm happy with a mix, but I'm never satisfied. I'm always, you know, even if we get to the end of the show and everybody's thrilled. I'm still going to be looking for that way to to make an improvement for the next one. And uh, all right, we should be wrapping it up here. Um, coming up next week, we will have hopefully another roundtable. Uh, we're going to pick up on gear. Uh, we're probably also going to talk about a few other things, like I'm fixing to make a movie at work, and so I'm doing some research into surround sound and, and DVD encoding and a, a bunch of other interesting things. And what else? What else? I think that's about it. All right, I'm going to wrap it up here. I am John Dayton, your host for the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast, signing off from BNB Sound North American headquarters with John Bioko, and we will see you next week. Thanks.